Welcome to the Asia Ventilation Forum um, ICU Tips and Tricks. Today, we are privileged to have Professor Manu Malbrain. Um, he's a professor of critical care research at the Medical University of Lublin, Poland, the president of the International Fluid Academy, and the founding president of the Abdominal Compartment Society, which was formerly known as the World Society of the Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. We are very excited today because in the first um, we are going to actually have um, a slide set that is going to be shared to us by Professor Malbrain. So our listeners that are on Spotify, we are advising that you switch over to the YouTube um, version of this podcast because we are going to uh, go into the technical portions about um, intra-abdominal pressure and respiratory failure from Professor Malbrain. Um, from time to time, I will be asking him questions, um, especially to clarify certain points that he will be making. Um, good morning, Professor. Yeah, good morning, uh, Yep. Uh, it's really uh, an honor uh, to be here um, in this uh, early time of the day. So, and uh, it's also an honor to be able to share what I'm passionate about for the last, I think, uh, 25 years. Uh, which is the impact of uh, abdominal pressure on uh, organ function and organ-organ crosstalk. It may sound complicated, but I will explain you that it's very simple and you can get uh, tips and tricks out of it uh, at the bedside uh, when you're doing your daily uh, ward rounds. So to sum up the effects of abdominal hypertension, and you must... Uh, Imagine that uh, the abdomen can be considered uh, as a fluid-filled compartment, hence it should follow the law of Pascal. So when there is an increase in intra-abdominal volume, uh, the abdomen will expand, and basically it's the abdominal wall, the ventral wall, uh, that will be distended. But at the same time, the pressure will also be exerted not only on all abdominal organs, like the kidneys and the liver and the gut, but also by pushing the diaphragm up, there will be compression on the heart, on the lungs, and as a sub, uh, sequence, there will be also increased intracranial pressures. So if we now today focus on the respiratory system, you will see that uh, abdominal hypertension uh, will cause uh, a decrease in lung volumes. And this will result in more dead space ventilation increased shunting atelectasis, and by means of increased intrathoracic pressures, the alveolar pressures will increase, as well as peak inspiratory pressures if you would use um, uh, volume-controlled ventilation mode without uh, autoflow. Um, this uh, is usually the consequence of fluid overload, so it is uh, mostly accompanied by pulmonary edema, pleural effusions. Also, because of this, in patients with sepsis, there is thickening of uh, the ventral uh, wall and the chest wall. The elastins will increase, meaning that the compliance will be reduced. Um, and this will uh, result in difficult ventilation. So with respect to recruitment maneuvers, opening the lungs, keeping the lungs open, um, and so forth. So I think it's uh, fascinating, and today uh, we would like to understand more how, at the bedside, uh, we need to adapt uh, the ventilator. And this is based on an open access publication, which, of course, uh, we can share uh, after this mm -hmm. presentation. So this is a slide by uh, Luciano Gattinoni and Paolo Pelosi. Um, so on the left-hand side, if you're looking at elastins, uh, it is a combination of the lung elastins and the chest wall. So in normal uh, conditions, uh, the lung elastins uh, has the biggest impact on the total respiratory system uh, elastins. And this is in conditions where intra-abdominal pressure is normal. If abdominal pressure increases, um, as I explained to you, in a patient with sepsis, with fluid overload, there is ascites, there is thickening of uh, 
the chest wall by fluids in the interstitium, the chest wall will play a much more important role. So if we look at the total elastance, now the chest wall may play 50% um, of, uh, of it, meaning that there will be an important impact of intra-abdominal pressure on respiratory mechanics, because you have the lung part and the chest wall part. So let's illustrate this in a practical example. If you would have a sticky atelectasis needing a transpulmonary pressure of 30 to open the lung. And if you take into account normal ratio between lung and chest wall elastance, a ratio of 0 0.6, then you need to apply a peak pressure of 60 centimeters of water in order to open the sticky atelectasis. But if you now have the same patient with a high abdominal pressure, so the ratio between lung and chest wall has changed, the transpulmonary pressure will only be 24. And you will not have open to sticky atelectasis because it's the transpulmonary pressure that opens and not the absolute pressure that we measure uh, via the ventilator because the pressure measured by the ventilator is the sum of the alveolar pressure and the pressure surrounding the alveolus, which is the intrathoracic pressure, which is difficult to measure. Uh, you can only do so by an esophageal uh, balloon tilt mm -hmm. catheter in the lower third of the esophagus. Or you could use abdominal pressure as a surrogate. There are some ratios that are placed here regarding the what what we think is a normal um, ratio between the elastance of the lung and total elastance. Yeah. So it, this is the the threshold is 0. 0.6 for normal, and I suppose that is a range actually. Um, yeah, but that depends on uh, body composition and anthropomo anthropometric uh, data, because we know that obese patients because they have a very thick chest wall, a lot of uh, subcutaneous fat and, and tissue weighing on, on the chest. So, and this is also related to intra-abdominal pressure. So basically, the higher the intra-abdominal pressure, the lower the ratio, and the more important the chest wall uh, becomes. So there is no absolute uh, cutoff value, and this value will change over time during the stay in the ICU. If you're giving the patient fluids, if it develops yes. pleural effusions, this will also have an impact, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, so don't don't um, fix yourself to these numbers. Forget about the numbers. It's just uh, an example, an illustration, uh, so that you can understand that if abdominal pressure is increased, indeed, um, opening pressures uh, need to be adapted as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is a slide uh, adapted just to illustrate that recruitment is an ongoing process. So it's not an all or not phenomenon. As long as you're increasing pressures, you will recruit more and more long areas. And usually it's the dorsal basal regions uh, who are the most resistant ones to recruitment. And you can have a kind of disp distribution of average opening pressures needed to recruit different lung regions. If you would compare this to a patient with intra-abdominal pressure, you will see that the opening pressures or the range of pressures that will open alveoli is increased as I showed you earlier, because of the impact on chest wall elastance. So you now understand that a recruitment maneuver, there are different ways uh, for recruiting, but one of the classical ones is the 40 by 40 maneuver. So you have a pressure of 40 centimeters of water and you last it for 40 seconds. Right? And you can see as long as you wait, there will be more and more recruitment, but after 40 seconds, we assume that 90 to 100% uh, 
uh, has been reached. So now, because of the transmission from the abdominal pressure to the thorax compartment, this transmission, if you look at animal data and human data, is on average about 50%. 50, uh, 50 so you could say if abdominal pressure is 20, I adapt my opening pressure, so I have a recruitment maneuver, 50 centimeters water times 40 seconds. The problem is that abdominal pressure, like any body pressure, central venous pressure, arterial pressure, is expressed in millimeters of mercury. So if you have an abdominal pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury, that would equal to 27 centimeters of water. Right. Uh, so, in order not to make it too complicated, um, we could just leave uh, the abdominal pressure in millimeters of mercury, which takes into account this 1.36 conversion from millimeters mercury to centimeters of water. Um, so, for me, it's as good if you just uh, keep uh, abdominal pressure in millimeters of mercury and divide by two. But it wouldn't make much of a, of a difference. And then when it comes to long protective ventilation from the guidelines, we know that we should limit plateau pressures below 30 centimeters of water. So here is the same. If you limit plateau pressures to 30 centimeters of water in a patient with an abdominal compartment syndrome and pressures of 25, I can guarantee you that your tidal volumes will maybe only be 150 ml and you will only perform that space ventilation. Mm. And you 2 will go up and your patient will be in respiratory acidosis. So that's why uh, we allow plateau pressures when measured by the ventilator to be higher. And we should calculate transpulmonary plateau pressures which again, as stated in the formula there, is the uh, plateau pressure as measured minus half of the abdominal pressure taken into account on average a 50% transmission abdominal to the thorax. In the paper that um, you can read, you will see that there is another formula because in ICU patients, on average, abdominal pressure is 10 millimeters of mercury, which would be seven centimeters of water. So the formula is a little bit adapted and it would be seven minus plateau pressure um, minus the intra-abdominal pressure times 0 0.7. And then you have the exact conversion from the millimeters of mercury to the centimeters of water. Thank you very much for that one because I, I was always wondering about um, which, uh, how to make these corrections yep. since uh, we had run into these uh, articles as early as 2004 about how to correct it for oh, yes, intra-abdominal hypertension. And, and even before um, uh, in, in articles looking at esophageal pressure. So normally you need to measure esophageal pressure and the transpulmonary pressure would then be measured plateau pressure minus intrathoracic pressure, which would be the pressure measured in the esophagus. But that is quite cumbersome to do so uh, at the bedside. So that was for opening. And because of the abdominal pressure is pushing, so the dorsal basal regions of the lung have a tendency to collapse. So if you are on your deflation limb, you will see that at some point the lungs will be closed. But here in abdominal hypertension, uh, the lungs will collapse uh, already at uh, yeah. higher pressures earlier. So this means that you need a higher PEEP in order to keep open what we just have recruited with the higher opening pressures. And here as a rule of thumb, you can set the PEEP in centimeters of water equal to the intra-abdominal pressure in millimeters of mercury, okay? Mm, beautiful. This, and this again takes into account a 40% um, 
loss of transmission uh, because, of course, the abdomen, some of the pressure may go uh, to the ventral region, to the pelvic region, and some will push uh, the diaphragm up. So how I set PEEP, and also for COVID patients, you just set the PEEP equal to the abdominal pressure because if abdominal pressure is increased, you need to set the PEEP to compensate for uh, the diaphragm that is pushed upwards and in order to keep the lungs open. Why is this also true in COVID? Because we've seen that uh, the patients that ended up in the ICU, especially in the first wave, were the ones with a very high body mass uh, index. Sure. This is illustrated in the video here. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, a normal uh, abdominal pressure. The video is not playing well. So, but you see that the dorsal basal regions are okay. And on the right-hand side, abdominal pressure is increased in combination with muscle relaxants. And, and that is the problem. Then you see this uh, shift of the dorsal basal region also of the diaphragm going up and creating some compression uh, atelectasis. So this is just an illustration. So what happens now if we not only have abdominal hypertension, but also ARDS. Um, we know that in COVID patients, there are different types of respiratory failure. Some have ARDS with capillary leak and pulmonary edema, some don't. So this is a animal study, a pig study with an oleic acid lung injury model. So the lungs were damaged by introducing oleic acid, and you can see that because of that, uh, there is capillary leak, insult, inflammation, and the lungs are white. So they are dense, they are filled with fluid. We then apply a pressure of 20, and you can see that you can squeeze the fluids out of the alveoli into the interstitial space. And if you have a very high pressure, you can see that you can clear whole the lung and uh, push the fluids out. But now, this is zero abdominal pressure. But if abdominal pressure is increased, you can see two things. You can see that the diaphragm is pushed upwards. So lung volumes are compressed. And you can see now with the pressure of 40, you have not recruited the whole lung areas. Why? Because the transpulmonary pressure is not 40, but 40 minus 20 is only 20, and you have not opened uh, the lungs. So I think this nicely illustrates the difference between just uh, ARDS of, or pulmonary edema and in combination with uh, abdominal pressure. If we then look at the density of the lungs, so which is the, the, the excess in tissue weight, uh, because to measure uh, extravascular lung water, you, theoretically, you need to take out the lung to weigh it, then you need to dry the lung and you weigh it. And the difference between wet and dry is the lung water. Okay? Well, in patients, it's not possible unless they died. And, and there have been some studies looking at transpulmonary thermal dilution in patients just before they died and then uh, gravimetry uh, measurements of lung water. So if abdominal pressure is normal, you can see that the water excess, the pulmonary edema, basically is in the dorsobasal regions. But if you then increase abdominal pressure, you see that the whole lungs get flooded. So there is an exponential effect of pulmonary edema, increased lung water, and abdominal hypertension. So it will be much more difficult to get the fluids out of the lungs. Also, because abdominal hypertension will have an impact on lymphatic system and the usual drainage of the um, uh, pulmonary edema. So, PEEP equal to the abdominal pressure. But then we learned from Luciano Gattinoni that there may be different phenotypes in COVID uh, ARDS. So, this is the paper that you can have a look at. It summarizes what I'm uh, presenting today. And we also published a paper on mechanical ventilation in fibrotic lung. Uh, 
So I think an obese patient with COVID is a bit of the combination of this. So there will be abdominal hypertension and there will be also fibrotic destruction at the later stages of the lung. So this is what uh, Luciano Gattinoni defined as the L and the H phenotype. So the L phenotype has a low elastance, low shunt, low lung weight, low recruitability. So basically there is an issue with the lungs and not uh, an issue with the chest wall or with uh, pulmonary edema or capillary leak. And then you have the H uh, phenotype with the high elastance and then, of course, the low uh, compliance, which is a bit uh, what we uh, discussed previously. On top of that, you have the issues with fibrotic areas, which means that um, there will be more strain uh, in uh, fibrotic lungs. And you can see this illustrated by a squishy ball. If you squeeze it, some areas will pop out with increased volumes because the other areas are resistant to this, uh, to this change. And this is illustrated uh, in this video. You can see if you squeeze it, some areas and this are then alveoli. So some will be over distended and others will not be recruited. Uh, and this makes things um, even more uh, complicated because there we will need uh, an other uh, approach when it comes to lung protective ventilation because we want to avoid shear stress, which is opening and closing of alveoli, which may induce ventilator-induced uh, lung injury. So if I would uh, translate an L and an H phenotype in patients with uh, COVID and abdominal hypertension, I think... Uh, the each phenotype would then have increased abdominal pressure, increased body mass index, an increased positive cumulative fluid balance. You can use biorectical impedance analysis and you can measure the volume excess, or you can use a PICO catheter and measure the extravascular lung water. So if these are increased, you may have an H phenotype. And if we then would combine Gattinoni's LNH phenotype with respect to lung mechanics, and then what I would call uh, with respect to the comorbidities and the fluid mm -hmm. status and so forth, I would suggest four uh, phenotypes, which is the LL up to the HH phenotype. And probably each of these four will need a different setting of the ventilator with respect to recruitment, opening the lungs, peep setting, keeping the lungs open and lung protective ventilation, setting your driving pressure below 14 centimeters uh, of water. I think this was uh, just a couple of slides that I presented. I could uh, discuss uh, much more because I believe it's a fascinating topic. I'm an internal medicine physician and uh, intra-abdominal pressure because the abdomen is the center of the body it has an impact on all organ systems, uh, not only within the abdominal cavity, but also uh, outside. Since it seems like a very useful uh, measurement to make, especially when we're fine-tuning our mechanical ventilation, would you then recommend that we measure intra-abdominal pressure in everyone in the ARDS? Yeah. So the first thing is that there need to be uh, awareness that abdominal pressure exists and that it, it's an important uh, parameter. For me, it's just another vital sign next to respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, and so forth. So first, we need to think about it, that it exists. And to my understanding, there is still a lack of general clinical awareness of this vital sign in critically ill patients, but also outside uh, the ICU and in other uh, conditions like, for instance, liver transplant surgery, or even medical conditions like uh, patients with chronic uh, uh, lymphatic leukemia who, who may have uh, extramedullary hematopoiesis and will have a, a huge uh, spleen, uh, for instance, um, 
that uh, we, we are not aware that it's so important in, in many diseases and, and conditions. Uh, for instance, a patient with a ventricular peritoneal shunt who suddenly mm -hmm. develops headache and um, cranial hypertension because of constipation. Could be just that. You give uh, just gas. <laughs> yeah, gas and stool. You give a rectal enema, abdominal pressure drops, and the VP shunt is functioning properly. These are just simple examples uh, of these organ organ uh, interactions that, that we may not be aware. So, first thing is the, the awareness. Then, the second thing is okay, should I measure in everyone then, or should I select my, uh, my patient? I don't think it's useful to measure in every patient, but maybe it's useful to obtain a baseline abdominal pressure measurement when the patient is admitted to ICU, just to have an idea. Is the pressure normal? Is it slightly increased? Uh, and so forth. And then based on some risk factors for abdominal hypertension, which are related to one, compliance of the abdominal wall. Is there normal or decreased compliance? And as I told you, compliance is decreased in obese patients, in um, patients uh, who, who may uh, have... Uh, it, it, it's, in, it's improved in patients who had previous surgery, for instance, or in patients, uh, in women who gave childbirth because then there has been a stretch uh, on the fascia and compliance is uh, increased. So you have a kind of protective mechanisms and uh, in burn patients, compliance is decreased if there mm -hmm. are uh, scars on the, the abdominal wall. So first is abdominal compliance. Just think about it. Uh, is it uh, increased or decreased? Uh, male, men uh, who are doing uh, a lot of physical exercise and have a six pack, Unfortunately, they have a low compliance. So if compliance is low, it means that for a given increase in intra-abdominal volume, the pressure will exponentially increase. So it's a bit the same like uh, intracranial pressure when it increases yes. in related to volume. So first is compliance. The second is, is there any increased intraluminal content or fluid? For instance, gastric uh, distension. Uh, ileus uh, or Gilvy syndrome um, and these kind of things. Third question, is there uh, any increased free abdominal fluids? And then we think of uh, ascites, mm -hmm. uh, we think of uh, hematoma, we think of an abscess or these kind of things. And then the fourth and this risk factor is the most prevalent one because we give too much fluids to our patients. So if there is sepsis, capillary leak, and overzealous crystallite fluid administration, there will be second and third space fluid accumulation. And these patients uh, are at risk for abdominal hypertension. And then some specific patient population, like the ones with severe acute pancreatitis, uh, the ones with burns, uh, emergency abdominal surgery, abdominal vascular surgery, patients on ECMO uh, because of the venous congestion also will have... Um, a lot of fluid accumulated in the in the abdomen. So this is the theoretical part. So you need to understand uh, what leads to abdominal hypertension. If there are two or more risk factors, you obtain a baseline measurement. If it's in the high range, you follow up and obtain every four to six hours uh, an abdominal pressure measurement. And then when you have this information, it's like pure gold you will have the ability to understand pathophysiology of uh, end organ function much better. If a patient has a high intracranial pressure, but abdominal pressure is 20, don't focus on the brain, focus on the abdomen. Right. If a patient has a high CVP of 20, and you say, I'm not giving fluids, it's fluid overloaded, but abdominal pressure is 25, transmural CVP hence comes down. So you can calculate transmural CVP same way as I showed you uh, to calculate uh, transpulmonary uh, plateau pressures. Um, 
when you look at functional hemodynamics, post-pressure variation, because of the increase in intrathoracic pressure, these uh, uh, values will change as well. So your thresholds uh, change. If okay, you okay. want to do enteral nutrition and abdominal pressure is increased, maybe you need to come down with uh, the speed of enteral nutrition. For the kidneys, uh, it has an impact on uh, filtration gradient. So it has an impact on everything we do. And if you don't take it into account, you will probably cause harm to the patient. So um, awareness, risk factors, baseline measurement, then your question is how to do it. Right. Uh, <laughs> most, most of the ICU patients do have a bladder catheter and an A-line and a central line. Otherwise, they probably don't need to be in the ICU. But with any standard Foley catheter, um, you can measure the height of the urine column. So like in the old days, uh, when we used to measure central mm -hmm. venous pressure, it was with a water column. Right, right, with a manometer. Okay. So there is a commercially available technique, which is the Foley manometer, which you put in between the Foley and the urine collection bag, and you lift up uh, this catheter. It has a, a filter for sterile air inlet, and you can see a meniscus of urine. And you take your zero point at the level where the mid axillary line crosses the iliac crest, patient in supine position at end expiration, as with any body pressure, CVP, we always measure end expiration. So, and that's how you can do it. Uh, it's very uh, convenient, very sim simple. Uh, you could uh, put a transducer in between, plush uh, disease of sterile uh, saline, and then you can obtain the pressure on your bedside monitor. And you can it's see 25 cc's. Yeah, not too much, eh? because if you put too much, you will distend the bladder and you will create uh, a contraction of the tension. muscle. Um, also, not too cold, because this will also create... Oh, that's important. Uh, yeah, should be ambient uh, or, or patient temperature, but ambient is fine, not uh, not too cold. Maximum 20 cc's, zero reference, mid-axillary line. And then you wait for stabilization 30 seconds, and then you measure it end of expiration. See, I recall um, because um, we are actually, uh, I'm proud to say, one of the centers that actually performs this uh, intra abdominal pressure measurement. And we had been attempting to fine tune our mechanical ventilation with uh, the measurements. The mathematics used to be, I think, much harder. <laughs> and so the formulas that you have shared today are very um, useful to me that um, needs to see these patients. But um, I remember a, a discussion that I had with um, other consultants at bedside about the use of, um, they were leery about measuring the pressures and just wanted to um, think about the presence or absence of intra-abdominal hypertension just by looking at um, abdominal size, abdominal girth. And I argued at that time that there was one part of the equation we didn't know, which was the compliance of the abdomen. So was I right in thinking that uh, girth is not a very good... Absolutely. Um, I, I can send you... We, we actually studied this and published hmm. uh, a paper on the relation between the abdominal perimeter, so the circumference, um, and uh, the uh, intra-abdominal pressure via the bladder. There is some relation between the delta. So mm -hmm. if the perimeter increases the abdominal pressure, but not for the absolute value. Why not? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the distended abdomen, you don't know how the fat distribution or the intra-abdominal volume distribution is because you can have um, central fat distribution, and this is what we refer to as the apple-shaped uh, distended uh, abdomens, uh, central obesity, which is uh, metabolic syndrome and, and uh, insulin resistance and these kind of things, also related to abdominal hypertension. And you can have a peripheral obesity uh, with a distended abdomen, but the fat is under the skin. And if you do a CT scan of these different types, so you have the same abdominal distension, but if you would do a CT scan, if you have peripheral 
uh, fat distribution, it's like an oval. And if you have central fat distribution, it's like a sphere. Mm -hmm. And once you have a sphere, if there is any further extra volume, you will have an exponential increase in your pressure. If you have an oval, there is still place to reshape to a sphere. And I can also send a very interesting paper on the neglected role of abdominal compliance to understand organ-organ interaction. Uh, because that's what you need to know exactly. It's not the perimeter or the distension. It is the compliance. It is the reserve that an abdominal cavity has to hold Absolutely. more volume without having an increase in pressure. Right. Thank you. So you were right. Thank you. <laughs> that's uh, that is very nice to hear. Um, I, we will be sharing those um, those um, papers that you will be sharing with us later on. We will we'll post them within the um, the descriptions of the YouTube or the Spotify podcasts. I think my next question is: um, Recently, we had. Um, we were able to find descriptions of patients that seem to improve their respiratory mechanics after being given an external compression of the abdomen, which seems to be counterintuitive to everything that we had talked about today. Could you comment on those? Yeah, I've seen. Do you refer to Antoine Villar Baron? Uh, he, he published yeah. a, a case, or I saw it. Um, in fact, and, and I. Um, I don't have a real explanation, except that maybe it has to do with abdominal wall compliance and that these patients um, may have a different uh, abdominal wall compliance, which then would translate to a change in chest wall compliance and so forth. So the problem is that uh, there are not much clinical studies where we have all data on total respiratory system compliance separated into the lung versus the chest wall. But from a, um, I would I say, uh, intuitively, it's counterintuitive mm -hmm. that if you would push on uh, the abdomen that you would improve um, improve uh, respiratory mechanics um, because we know that when proning a patient and if this patient has increased abdominal pressure proning and putting the patient on the belly will further increase abdominal pressure mm -hmm. so there will be no beneficial effect on oxygenation from proning whereas if you use suspensions on the the sternum chest and, and the chest and on uh, the pubic bone and the abdomen can hang uh, freely down. There may even be a gravity force and a suction force of the abdomen, hence um, recruiting the dorsobasal uh, regions. Um, there have been studies where you place a weight on the thorax, on the chest, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, 10, 15 kilos, like three uh, bags of substitution fluid for CVVH. Um, in the patient, of course, in the supine position. So you, you drew, reduce locally chest wall uh, compliance there, hence forcing the tidal volume to go to the dorsal basal uh, areas. Um, oh, it's a local effect. Yeah, rather than a, like rather than a general. Yeah, effect. yeah. I see. Um, okay. But uh, no, I don't have an explanation that uh, applied abdominal pressure could improve respiratory uh, mechanics. And maybe it has to do with the LH phenotype or the LLHH phenotype. Uh, I can't believe that this would be beneficial in an old patient, but maybe in some patients could be where uh, the uh, atelectasis or, or the, the, the regions that are affected by COVID are not in the dorsal basal uh, 
part of the lungs, but maybe in the ventral regions. Then you could uh, theoretically imagine that by pushing on the abdomen, you will force basically a compression of the dorsal basal regions, and then tidal volume may go to the elsewhere to the other regions that are affected. I don't know. Okay, well, thank you for because uh, it was uh, very difficult to understand because it was counterintuitive. Um, were, this, were there other things that you wanted to do um, discuss regarding our topic? Um, no, I, 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 it's just uh, good to be able to give this short presentation. So uh, to make uh, young doctors or researchers interested in, in the field of abdominal pressure. Very interesting to also see how um, changes in position, patient's position would be um, to Absolutely. see if you can optimize. Because the thing is that uh, with the society, the guidelines state that we should put the patient in the supine flat. position, flat position, which sometimes is not... Uh, uh, not not advocated, uh, for instance, in patients with traumatic brain injury and so forth, or a uh, patient uh, who may uh, vomit or whatever. Um, and, and usually the patients are in the head of bed 30, 45 degree position to prevent uh, aspiration and ventilator-associated pneumonia. So having continuous techniques will allow us to measure the pressure supine and then in head of bed. And then you have a dynamic maneuver which allows to non-invasively estimate abdominal wall compliance. Mm -hmm. Because if your pressure supine is 10 and in the head of bed it's 17, then you know that compliance is low. Slow. And that patient uh, will be at risk uh, for, for having exponential increases in pressure with small increases uh, in volume. One caution for, for the young doctors is that whenever you have a patient with a distended abdomen, think about abdominal pressure. If this patient is in respiratory distress and needs intubation mechanical ventilation, always, always put a nasogastric tube first. I've seen patients who were sedated and even curarized, and then they had dramatic gastric aspiration uh, and eventually uh, died. So I think the first step would be in those patients, or maybe perform ultrasound, let's say uh, point of care ultrasound is the modern stethoscope. Just look at uh, your antral cross-sectional area uh, to see if um, the stomach is distended, then put a nasogastric tube first, aspirate all the contents and then go for a, a crush intubation or maybe awake you know, some midazolam some ketamine patient remains more or less awake and you can easily uh, intubate them and protect uh, the airway i learned something new again thank you very much um so we have been um discussing the importance of intra-abdominal pressure um, with regards to our strategies in mechanical ventilation and um, doc, uh, Professor Malbrain, do you have any final words for our listeners? I would say uh, join the uh, Abdominal Compartment Society. Uh, it's a free lifetime uh, membership. We want to uh, revive uh, the society and get more and more young doctors interested uh, in the abdominal compartment uh, and interested to performing research. Uh, maybe uh, to set up some guidelines in their country or to perform a small survey on the knowledge uh, of the colleagues and the consultants uh, on these matters. And next uh, invitation would be to join the International Fluid Academy, which is also a complementary uh, lifetime. And you get a lot of uh, resources, uh, videos, presentations uh, from which you can uh, learn and share. Thank you. I remember seeing the first emails from the uh, Society of Abdominal Compartment Syndrome, the very first ones, the very first invitations. And um, now I'm regretting never never having joined, but I see that it's not too late. Yeah, it's so, never too late. 
<laughs> so, um, so thank you very much, Professor Malbrain. Um, this has been a great um, edition of the AVF podcast, um, ICU Tips and Tricks, again with uh, Professor Manu Malbrain. Um, we are available on Spotify and YouTube. And um, for this edition, it would be better to watch it on YouTube rather than just to listen it on Spotify because of the great um, images and data that uh, Professor Malbrain has shared with us. So again, thank you very much and have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Jeff, for the invitation and stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.